so I'm delighted to have uh, eminent scholars on this first panel of uh, Tibet-Mongol Relations Conference. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to be uh, keeping my intervention to minimal. I'm just going to be uh, executing the role as that of a glorified timekeeper. So I'm just going to be looking after your time. And then, um, so it turns out that every all the speakers will be given 15 to 20 minutes to speak. And then I'll make an intervention to remind you that the time 15, 16, 17 minutes has elapsed. So with this, I will request uh, uh, Professor Bad, uh, Badbayar Tsetendamba to uh, the, the first speaker of the uh, panel, and he will be speaking on Mongolia and Tibet in 1900 to 1913, from Qing dynasty control to independence. So I will request you to uh, begin with your presentation and conclude within 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, good afternoon. So it's my pleasure to be here in Dharamsala uh, for the maybe uh, first conference of Mongolian Tibetan academics um, on historical relations between Mongolia and Tibet, but focusing on the 20th century. Uh, this morning we had uh, a welcome speech by uh, Professor Dawat Serang and Honorable Rimbuchi. They talked a lot about uh, history of Mongolian Tibetan relations beginning from 13th century. So we have very ri rich history of relations. So it's our two speakers told us that uh, the two nations, Mongolians, two people, Mongolians and Tibetans, share very rich historical ties and bonds. So I fully agree with this formula. Today uh, I will talk uh, about 20th century beginning of the 20th century. Uh, in the beginning of 20th century, both Mongolia and Tibet were part of Manchu Qin dynasty. We were not independent nations, not independent countries, but we were part of the big uh, Qin dynasty. But uh, We had a, a common dream, we had a common fate. We wanted to become free, free of uh, Qin Dynasty domination, free of Qin Dynasty control. So we faced the uh, same dilemma. So we wanted uh, a strong third nation to help us to be free. So for Mongolia, it was uh, Russia. You know that this morning, the speakers told us that Mongolia is uh, surrounded by two powerful countries, China to the south, Russia to the north. 
So in the beginning of 20th century, Mongolia sought Russian help uh, to be free of Qin Dynasty domination. As well as Tibet, I think, sought uh, British help to get free of Manchu Qin Dynasty control, Manchu Qin Dynasty domination. Uh, as you know that in the beginning of 20th century, both after uh, Xinhai Revolution in China, which overthrown Qin Dynasty, both Mongolia and Tibet declared its independence. Mongolia ate Jabzun Dambo Hotokto, the king of Mongolia, declared independence in December 19. 11, uh, the 13th Dalai Lama, His Holiness, Dalai Lama declared Tibet independence in February 1913. So both Mongolia and Tibet formally declared its independence. As esteemed scholar, Western scholar John King Fairbank wrote, you can see on the PowerPoint, he wrote <coughs> in his book that the vast areas of Mongolia, vast, vast areas of Mongolia, Tibet, in Turkestan, Turkestan is today's Xinjiang. So Mongolia, Tibet, and Turkestan, where the Manchu power was established, they not belong to China, but they were part of Manchu Qin Dynasty. That's why when Qin Dynasty collapsed, both Tibet and Mongolia declared its independence. We were never part of China. We were part of Qin Dynasty. So that's why after when Qin Dynasty collapsed, we declared our independence. We go to the next slide. Uh, in my opinion, two Remarkable things were common in Mongolia and Tibet in the beginning of the 20th century. So both, as I said, both see the Manchu Qin Dynasty uh, is a special arrangement, special agreement. Uh, and when Qin Dynasty collapsed, both Tibet and Mongolia will go on their own way, not Chinese way. But Mongolia will go Mongolian way, Tibet will go Tibetan way. The second common thing is that the both sides a geographical position which were very vulnerable, and both were fear of domination and eventual assimilation by China's huge population. So if compared to China, both Mongolia and Tibet were very small nations in terms of population. Also, we both shared a very vulnerable geographic position. That's why I think both Mongolia and Tibet shared very important common destinies. Next, I will talk a little bit about uh, the significance of 13 Dalai Lama's stay in Mongolia in 1904-1906. As you well know that when British expedition came to Lahas, the 13 Dalai Lama had to go into exile to Mongolia. So he came to then capital city of Mongolia, which was called Ikhure. 
So it means uh, a big um, monast monastery location. And he stay, stayed there two winters. Oh, Dalai Lama stayed first winter in the capital city of Mongolia in Ikhure, in Gandam Monastery. Uh, second winter, he stayed in a smaller monastery, Wange Hure, which belonged to our one noble, uh, one of Chinggis Hang descendants, Tushet Hang Aymak, Handador Chingwang. You can see the Sotin Dalai Lama. He, that time he was very young. And as today some historians, researchers, especially Western researchers, think that Tibet elite, Tibet governing body was divided into three factions. <coughs> One faction wanted to stay with Qin Dynasty. They thought that it would be better if we stay with Qin Dynasty or Republic of China. The, the second faction wanted to go uh, with British. They wanted British help and they wanted <coughs> Western education, Western army, Western culture and to modernize Tibet with British help. The third faction wanted to uh, have a Russian protection. They thought that Russia is a better friend for Tibet than the other countries. So the one of purpose, why 13 Dalai Lama went to Mongolia. He wanted to be near to Russian Empire. So Mongolia was bordering with, to the north with Russian Empire. Yeah? So Dalai Lama thought he will be in Mongolia in Ikhure. Then he can communicate with Russian uh, diplomats and then he can ask for some kind of protection from uh, Russian empire. As you know that at that time, the leader of Mongolia was eight Chapter Damba Hotukt. He, he was second in ranking in Tibetan Buddhist establishment. So now some researchers suggest that there was some tension, some conflict between Dalai Lama and Japan Damba Hotokht. You know that Japanese professor Ishihama Yumiko, she wrote about this uh, conflict between Dalai Lama and the first reason the Dalai Lama came as a guest, but Jabzundamba Hotokt was a host, yeah? So they had some, <laughs> some conflict between of them. The second reason the Dalai Lama's stay in Mongolia was accompanied by, by financial burden. So Mongolian population, Mongolian nobles, they had uh, a lot of offerings to Dalai Lama. And it means that the offerings which were received by Jabzun Damba Hutokto was decreased because some offerings went to Dalai Lama. So the Jabzu Dambu Hotukt was not, not so happy. So there is some tension. But Mongolian researchers suggested even though there was some tension, but 
Both of them were very kind to each other. And they met several times uh, secretly in Gandam Monastery to talk, talk about common fate of Mongolia and Tibet and how to get rid of Chinese domination. So my main point today is that, that during Dalai Lama's stay in Mongolia during these two winters, the Dalai Lama initiated the very big dream project, grand union between Mongolia and Tibet. I call it the grand union. I, I first suggested this uh, a concept during 2011 conference in America, uh, you know, that there is a, <clears throat> a society called Mongolian Society of United States. It held, held annual conference. So 2011, I first proposed this concept that the, the Dalai Lama 13, who was the uh, initiator, author of this idea to have a grand union between Tibet and Mongolia. So when Dalai Lama was in Mongolia, a lot of Mongolian nobles, aristocrats came to pay homage to Dalai Lama. And all of them expressed the Dalai Lama will lead this grand union between Tibet and Mongolia to become a, a free nation. So they thought that if we unite Mongolia and Tibet, we can be strong in face of Chinese Republic of China's domination. If we separate Tibet and Mongolia, we, very, we will be very weak and we cannot resist Chinese domination. You can see the, the very influential Buryat monk, Agwan Dorjiu. We all know that this Sancho Agwan Dorji played a vital role when certain Dalai Lama came to Mongolia to seek protection from Tsarist Russia. He was a Buryat by birth, Russian Empire citizen, but he was very passionate for independence of Tibet and independence of Mongolia. So whole life he struggled for independence of Tibet and for alliance between Tibet and Mongolia. But his main point was that Russia, Russian Empire, will be a protector for both Tibet and Mongolia. In June 1905, the Russian ambassador in China, uh, Pocatillo, came to, especially came to Ikure to pay homage to Dalai Lama 13th. He brought uh, special gifts from Russian Tsar, Russian King, Nikolai, for Dalai Lama 13th. And Dalai Lama 13 asked him two questions. First, Dalai Lama would like to appeal to 
major world powers to have a special conference on Tibet issue. The second, Dalai Lama pros promised if Russia, Russian Tsar will help Tibet, he will grant the same trade rights to Russians, which he offered to bridge. So he wanted to make both Russian and British business have same rights in Tibet. Secondly, I will very briefly talk about treaty between Mongolia and Tibet in 1913 because there's uh, other speakers, Professor Samdang and Professor Batsakhan will talk in more detail about these kind of things. So a long time, uh, Western scholars didn't believe that Mongolia and Tibet concluded the treaty, bilateral treaty in 1913. They thought it's a fake in modern term, yeah? Fake. But I think in 2010, we had a special conference in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. One of uh, main organizers was Ambassador Bolt, who today speak in open ceremony. This special conference was dedicated to Mongol-Tibet Treaty of 1913. So we wanted to have a credible papers, presentations by Mongolian academic scholars to prove that this treaty of Mongolia, Tibet is not fake, it's real treaty. So we Mongolian academics discovered in Mongolian archive the original copies of this treaty written in Tibetan language and in Mongolian language. So Professor Batsaha is one of Mongolian academics who first discovered these treaties in Mongolian archive. So we published in our academic journal the treaty in both languages, Tibetan and Mongolian. And yesterday we saw in Tibetan Museum, the Tibetan version, Tibetan language, photocopy of Tibetan language version of this treaty. But original copies we still have <laughs> in Ulaanbaatar. So Tibetan scholars, if you come to Ulaanbaatar, we can show you <laughs> the originals. You can see that after the declaration of independence, both countries had their own independence symbols. Tibet had its own Tibet national flag, Tibet national money, Tibet postal stamps. Mongolia also issued Mongolian national currency, banknotes, Mongolian postal stamps. So these are very important attributes of independent and sovereign nation. Maybe you young students cannot understand, but these national symbols are very important. So they distinguish us as an independent and sovereign nation. So we had both Tibet and Mongolia had own national flags, own national anthems, and national currencies. So my conclusion is that, that 
the Qing Dynasty and its successor, Republic of China, tried to reassert its suzerainty over Tibet and Mongolia, which Peking, today's Beijing, thought that both Tibet and Mongolia are inseparable parts of the Republic of China. Uh, but in May 1924, the Republic of China persuaded Soviet Russia to recognize formally its sovereignty over Outer Mongolia or Mongolia as part of China. However, with the death of eight Jiaozun Damba Hutut, the Soviet Union, Russia recognized Mongolia is People's Republic of Mongolia in 1924 and took the firm course to turn Mongolia into a close ally in the Soviet showcase in Asia. In 1946, the Republic of China accepted the independent status of Mongolian People's Republic under the pressure of Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. But Tibet way went into different way. In case of Tibet, the Republic of China, Nanjing government thought the death of 13 Dalai Lama in 1933 is an opportunity for Chinese to again reassert its control over Tibet. But the Republic of China met strong resistance from Tibet. As you know, it continued until up to 1951. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so very much, Professor Patbhai uh, Atsitandamba, for this very incredibly rich presentation. And uh, next, I would like to request uh, Professor Patsakhan uh, Okunoy, uh, and he will be speaking on the Declaration of Mongolia's Independence in 1911 by the 8th Box Chizundamba and he is the uh, he's associated with the Institute of International Studies, Mongolian Academy of Sciences, Mongolian Institute of Education, Culture and Law in Mongolia. So I would request you to begin with the presentation once when this technical issue is sorted and you will have 20 minutes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy in front of you to present my presentation. Now, first of all, I would like to dedicate my thanks to His Holiness Federal Bucci and the Beit Policy Institute inviting me to this conference. Well, see you on my uh, presentation uh, uh, topic, Declaration of Mongols Independence in 1911 by mm -hmm. Yates Bogjazunda Actually, this is history of Mongolia, beginning of uh, beginning of 20th century. How Mongolia gets independence? I try to give briefly. The reason of selection of the, this subject was issue of Mongolian independence in the beginning of the 20th century is a key problem of the study of Mongolian history of 20th century. Nowadays, Mongolians every December 29 celebrating. Uh, day of national independence. What were uh, December 29, 1911 in Mongolia? Little bit, uh, the Mongols formally uh, proclaimed for independence 29 December 1911. It was culmination of the struggle. They were working under the leadership of eight Bogdajabsundamba Utrakta to get independent from Sing Imperia. Actually, this uh, we will see the archival sources. The state name called just Mongolia, not uh, some uh, historical literature written, Bogdkin's Mongolia, or any other name is given. Just only state title is Mongolia. 
Bogdo was elevated as Bogdo, uh, the sunshine uh, married aged Han of Mongolian nation and the Tsarandara, his queen, as mother of the nation. And the Iran title would be elevated by many. Accordingly to Mongolian year, female peak, European year 1911 was made first year of the elevated by many. It was uh, continued until 1924 when the, eight, uh, the last emperor of Mongolia, Jefferson Nabahotakta, died. And Ikhure, as uh, Professor uh, Batoyer told, uh, to be called Nisl Khure, nowadays Ulaanbaatar, as you uh, know how we've been in Ulaan, uh, capital city of Mongolia, now called Ulaanbaatar. Ulaanbaatar was, you know, the monastic uh, city of Bogdin Khure, and changed name in uh, 1924 to the name Ulaanbaatar. As you know, this meaning the Ulaanbaatar. This is red hero. What is red means? Red means color of communism. That was given by Russian influenced people. Well, ex this is the uh, capital city of Mongolia, uh, picture painted by well famous Jukder, 1912. Actually, this was very clean, uh, small, uh, small city, Ikhure, what? And then this is very close to show uh, downtown of the Ikhure. Actually, I well, it's not possible. To show this, uh, the ceremony held in Mongolian Gir, traditionally Mongolian, tra because, but so there were too many uh, monasteries, uh, uh, Buddhist monasteries, but Bogd uh, Hang was a uh, spiritual leader religion, but so Mongolian decided ceremony getting independent should be, uh, internalization should be in Mong by Mongolian tradition and get uh, b very big, large get. Uh, uh, Great Hang issued a decree, Jabz uh, Ndamba Lama is he addressed princesses and the masses and appointed ministers of his government after he was enthroned as Hang of Mongolian nation. I've been supported and elevated by many to the throne of Mongolian state. Uh, Buddhism, uh, all of us strive to spread Buddhism as billions of rays of sun make the mon monarchy as strong as the Mount Sumeri and how my Mongolian subjects, said Bogdhan, all was prosperity and culture of peace and tranquility and promote particularly that all of you, beginning with you, Hans, once princesses, to many subjects stick to justice and truth and to strive and the good of state religion, I decree to distribute favors at present. Uh, government, Mongolian government built with five ministries. And by Bogdan's decree, distributing favors of three, six, and eight lands were distributed to every old person aged seven to eight, eighty, eighty to ninety, ninety to one hundred years all res respectively. After favors were presented, a banquet wa was held for participants. Uh, about I said about, oh, this is the photo is, uh, from the Norway King uh, Archives, uh, 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 well-known uh, famous uh, Norwegian traveler, Oscar Maimeng. Uh, very few years ago described, uh, actually, Mongolian and Norwegian scholars. As we can see this here, this inside, in Karish Bogdhang, and uh, both side Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of, uh, in, in close side, Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, Minister of Military. Another side, another uh, two ministers. And then you can see this Mongols, how is, you know, respectfully, and then how was uh, dress, everything, culture, you can see this photo, very high quality. And then, actually, by the way, I can say this, in archives of Norway, you can find 10,000 photos uh, when he traveled to China, Mongolia, and uh, just after, nine, since 1911 until 1930s. Oh, okay, I maybe just better go to very far. This is Mongolia's uh, the day of ceremony. This is Winter Palace of Bogdhang, now the Bogdhang's museum, who happening in Ulaanbaatar maybe knows. Uh, this Gare Palace of First Mongolian Government House. 
uh, there were three seats for Bogdhan. Uh, the prestigious jet seat presented to him as Han, radiant as the sun marriage agent, and the wealthy power in the church and the state. Prestigious silver seat, and, uh, and that's what Lama's golden seat used by him as Bogda Lama. This one is and uh, closed here, this uh, jet seed, book trans, and then that side is uh, silver seals uh, script, you can see. And all uh, script is, uh, as you know, it is uh, Soyumbo and old Uyghur Mongol, Uyghur Mongol and Durbur Mongol. And the book trans state seal had sharp of Chandaman to symbolize the Mongols' aspiration to preserve and protect their independence and freedom. There were ins inscriptions on the top and four sides of Bogdan's silver seal. You can see, if you will, deeply in Mongolian language. It said, the sky kalim world tranquil state very strong and religion very holy. These waters uh, initiated and wrote by first under Again, first Jabzandamba Hutakta. After the many years, age spoke Jabzandamba when he gets independence, uh, was uh, read in his uh, seal. Mm. And this is golden seal, Bogdans. And all, yeah. this is mother's, yeah. nation's mother's seal, Queen, Donduk Dolma, came the mother of Mongolia, proclaimed the <coughs> same day. This is throne of Bogdan and, and the queens. And then this, you can see, the great king of Mongolia, eight spoke jobs in the Mortakta and queen of state mother Tonduk Dolma. This, the eight spoke jobs in the Mba stayed in Hure all time following he arrived. After being found when he was five years old, his life was closely connected with Mongolia. Actually, he was born um, in 1869 in uh, very near Lhasa in Tibet. And five years old came with family, all of seven <laughs> members of family came to Mongolia and stayed until 1924. And he actually, I would like to say, uh, he's not Tibetan, he's Tibetan Mongolian. As I would like to say this, like as you know this, American President Obama, African American, his Bogdra is Tibetan Mongolian. And he never been in Beijing. Hutakta Olim Buddha is venerated as much as Dalai Lama. When he reached in adulthood, he was to go to Peking to pay tribute to the Manchu Imperial and get blessing at Buddhist temple there. Since Peking government was concerned about the influence and adult in, and independent Hutukta, blessed Hutukta often happened to suddenly die in the way back in, in Mongolia and their incarnations were sought and found. But this Hotokta Aids book, Jabzandamba, didn't go to Beijing. When he reached adulthood, this put the pressure of Peking and those who surrounded him, postponing his trip under the various pre pretexts. He was safe in Hure, and it was possible in Hure to prevent from Peking's direct assassination attempt of, of on his life. And uh, 1910, his, he, give decree, the situation in Manchu in China shows that time has come. Now it is high time for the many IMX, for Mongolian nationalities to unite, establish their own state, promote their religion, and see an end of their suffering. But it will, will be required in anonymity of field, in joint force of all. And the Mongols, uh, in many the newspapers in Asia and uh, Amer uh, English and the other peoples, uh, give an uh, announcement uh, in these newspapers. Mongols revoice a new or more speci specifically who revival has become reality in Asia. Having proclaimed her independence, Mongolia became one of the first independent nation born in, in the beginning of the 20th century. Establishment of Mongolia in 1911 of independent state created new international situation in the region. 
uh, actually this geopolitical division and still change, not changed until today. How Mongols came to this achievement or before 1911, this situation, briefly I would like to say. Yakov Shuro, a Russian famous diplomat who spent some 50 years of his life in, in Mongolia noted in 1885, in case of conditions are to be created for Mongols to be united, and has has are certain to lead the moment towards it. Many factors account for that. The most important one is that in Hatha does recite the incarnations Japs and Damba, who all the Mongols and Halimiks venerate. The Mongols remember their history, he continued. They have not forgotten the struggle that they had led for centuries against Chinese and for their independent extents. The Mongols don't like to see themselves present. There were uh, many strike or levels of Tok Tok, Hai Sang, Bao Jiao in Mongolia and other against Manchu authority and Chinese in the beginning of 20th century. Throughout Manchu regime, the Mongols were in the position of privileged people and also this status ensured peace and a certain amount of prosperity. It served separate the Mongols of the last vestige of those dualities, which had made them conquerors of three or four of the world towards the latter part of the region, when Chinese culture had already developed Manjus, the effects of Chinese colonization and infiltration also began to be felt by the Mongols. And the dome full of Manjus also spelled their doom. Still, this stream of Chinese immigration took place. Its wake followed a radical change in the land laws, which annulled the validity of the ti title deeds formerly granted by the Mongol princesses. The process actually affected in Mongolia only by Servet to alienate out of Mongolia, which by reason of its remoteness had escaped the Chinese in infiltration. Actually, the, we know the Manju new policy course. Actually, the first, uh, the beginning, yes, the Manju Qing Imperial uh, policy was uh, very different, very, ex uh, as mentioned I above, very friendly to uh, concern Mongolia. And uh, uh, 1878, uh, end of the uh, 19th century, the uh, Manjong government changed policy. What was the new policy course said? Why it is considered impossible to let into Mongolia, which has a vast territory and a small population, Chinese citizens, and let them engage in farming? And how construction a railway between Hadong and Korea would affect the above situation and what are their justification? And such questions given many times. Japs and Damba, Potokta and other Mongolian princesses, after thorough consideration of the questions, defended their previous position on the opposing to the Chinese settlement in Mongolia. Their engaged, engagement in farming and expressed their conviction that mining would entail many negative consequences and the pastoral livestock freed the requirement moving to mountains during the winter. The meeting of Mongolian princes made all participants to realize that, that Mongols' life was becoming uh, precarious and they required a lot of uh, attention and efforts to protect it. A secret meeting held uh, summer of 1911 decided to send the secret legation to uh, Russian Imperia uh, and decided how to restore the Mongols independent and get assistance from Russia. This is Shemu Han Torch, who had it was special delegation, and the Dada Matsinjimet, who was a member of that, another one member of delegation from Inner Mongolia, Kung Hai Sang. And uh, they coming back from the Russian secret uh, visiting, they decided, uh, uh, organized a provisional government secretly uh, in Korea uh, and gave declaration of Mongols independent. Politics even taken place after the meeting held in Korea during the Tanshi offering to Bogdo, summer of 1911. And the Princess Secret meeting held in Bogdo's mountain showed that provisional government was in fact established in Mongolia, summer 1911. 
Well, this, uh, this is a Soyon Boleta, symbol of national liberation and independence of Mongolia. Uh, this is uh, last Manjo Ambang, who resided in and was expelled from Korea uh, for 1st for of December 1911. Uh, this is Imperial of Mongolia, 8 Bokjab Zindamba, who was born in Tibet in uh, 1869 as in Tibet came to Mongolia in 1874. Uh, he was uh, declared independence of Mongolia by his audience eight spoke jobs in December 29, 1911, as I told. And he passed away May uh, 20, 1924. Uh, he was uh, king, imperial of Mongolia from the 1911 until 1924, as uh, why my book called Last Imperial of Mongolia. Oh, that's okay, just, I will, I will go just, okay, yeah. This is agreement signed between Russia and Mongolia, Mongolian government, and then I will, let me go, as mentioned, Professor Batoyer, treaty between Mongolia and Tibet. Mongolia and Tibet having freed themselves from Manchu dynasty and separated from China, have formed their independent states and having view that both states from their immemorial have professed one and same religion and with a view of strengthening their historic and mutual friendship, have concluded the agreement in January 1913 in Nislhure, capital city of Mongolia. This is mentioned view. The you can see in Tibetan language, Tibetan yellow language. Uh, so in Mongolian language. Conclusion. Separation of, uh, in 1911 of the Mongols from Tsing state and the proclamation of restoration of their independence opened a new area in their history. With the elevation of Jabzindamba Hutokta to the throne as Han of the Mongolian nation and the naming of the nation Mongolia, area elevated by many in the Hure, Nisil Hure, a new history bega began in the early 20th century was the revival of the Mongols' nation in Asia. Famous Russian consul uh, Luba in 1912, uh, January 18, declared to the government uh, um, of Russia, if the history of the last few years of Mongolia is ever to be written, it will be underlined with gratitude, the brave and irresolute initiative of the eight Bokhtachabzindamba who accomplished what the bravest minds could only dare to uh, contemplate. In Kiyadid, Hotukta is without doubt person who led the event that led to the independence that Mongolia enjoys now because Buddhism was important factor that united all Mongols. Mongols considered that since Undergegen Tanazar, the first Bokhtachabzindamba was the song of Shethang, who was the Chinggis golden lineage, his incarnations were naturally related to the golden lineage. After being liberated, Wagda Khan uh, and his queen used to pay visit on the first day of Lunar New Year to after San Hans Urgo Palace. It may that mean to express continuation of tradition of Mongolian statehood as princesses of golden lineage and the influential statesmen may have instituted this ritual in Bogdhang intelligent and sensitive person supported it. Uh, Bogdhang could become object of veneration of Mongolian national religion before 1911. Uh, he surely became after the national revolution of 1911, not only spiritual, but also political leader, ruler of the Mongols in the true sense of the word. He is the father of the national revolution, which gave us independence, which marked this revival of Mongols. Thank you. 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 Thank
uh, for this very incredibly uh, incisive presentation. And next, the Namso Kenge Rwata Mojo Mixi Kogu Mare Wana Tholo Ke Ani Lobe Logi Lobe Ke Chama Samjhe Lagi Ani Thani Choshi Te Inji Napu Vati Te Resha Thanda Te Inji Na Tinge Te Tojan Se An Kela Te Tamshe Unsu Shuru Se Shuvei Inji Na Te Choshi Pu Vati Te Resha The Dalai Lama The Thirteen Dalai Lamas Attempt to Gain Recognition of Tibet's Independent political status and the significance of the water ox ordination that explicitly validates Tibet's independence political status. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Distinguished scholars from Mongolia and friends. Uh, I will try to summarize my talk in 20 minutes, so it's not easy. So I think I will try to speak the main points in English, and then uh, and the main my uh, notes is in Tibetan. So Tibetans, you can read the t uh, notes, and maybe you will get the sense. In a need the Tama Pi Nali events and Pi de Lonana, Pesce Tunda Tanala, Jesse Moton, Pesce Tang Dosare, and can some can some the series on the Alpine Bejonko at Dunga Jungirva. So, my topic is very simple. The Roma Santo. Caracolinem Gorda. Dirve. Okay. Yeah. So mm, the Java Kundi Jo Sunbe Chilo Nidon Chikdon Kubji Jung Ni Lo Pur Ranzin Chapter Cheva Se Di Tanda Dinema Dunse Keji Chushi Dunze Ke Dimbe Cheva Dig Nang Dunze Tangbudri or the Chushi Di Kanala Shero Chan Song Sun Chetan Didan Jebe Yetichi Ma Shia Tapsi Chigin Yerba. So the topic I was given to me was the independence, declaration of Tibetan independence by 13 Dalai Lama in 1912. So this was the topic given to me. And so I'll, my talk will be more or less concentrated around this topic, but uh, slightly different. Uh, my different perspective and different, my reading is slightly different what the uh, the popular statement, Declaration of Independence by 13 Dalai Lama. So this, uh, when I, this statement sometimes makes me feel uh, farther than that. So when you, a question, Declaration of Independence by 13 Dalai Lama in 1912 or 13, when, when this statement, it ultimately raised two questions. So it naturally, Give the it uh, the question is rise. What was the political status of Tibet before 1913 or 1912? Before the declaration, was the Tibetan affair was managed by the Tibetans? Was it a Tibet a self-governing sovereign country, or Tibet the Tibetan affair was dominated or controlled or? or dependent on a third power? So these two questions ultimately comes. So I'm not going to give my perspective, my answer, but I will put before you few important political events that took place between 19, 1895, because in 1895, 13 Dalai Lama came into power. From the year 13 Dalai Lama came into power to 1913 or 12, when so-called Declaration of Tibetan Independence was made by 13 Dalai Lama. So I will put some few important political events before you, and then you can make your judgment. That this statement, this event will give you the clear picture. So, Kupka Chosum in a chungi like a good chosum appear on the set a chaperus, Yonda Tisunguari. Set a chaperus, some way a tiki capsule, tit some but tiki chella, Rangshuk, Tivani Ungerva. 
so first, 13 Dalai Lama, when he came to power in 1895, he made five, uh, he, uh, he presented five important points before the uh, people. So this is this five point and the third five point which is made in the 1913 declaration is same. 1913 declaration, the Oxier ordinance. On this one, only one point different, otherwise same, four points are same. Now this fourth point, this five point declared by the 13th Dalai Lama in 1895 and after his enthronement could not be implemented until, 19, until 1913 because of the two reasons. The first reason is the, the ex-regent, they plotted some, they tried to, they, uh, they, they, they plotted to uh, kill 13th Dalai Lama and so there was too much internal disturbances and so uh, that was uh, one internal reason. The second reason was the British military expedition to Tibet in 1904. These are the two factors. Because of these two reasons, the 13th Dalai Lama could not implement the five uh, reforms proposed in 19, 1895. Now here, 1904, first, what was the Tibetan political status in 1904 when the British military invasions came to Tibet. This we must know. This is very important. So here is a very s simple incident. The British uh, army troops and the young husband, when arrived at the Yangtze, so the Chinese, the assistant Chinese ambassador in Lhasa, he went to Yangtze to meet the young husband. And what he said, now this is important, he said, the Manchu uh, Amban, the Manchu Amban in Lhasa intended, he was willing to come to Yangtze to welcome you, but he could not come to Yangtze because of what? Because he says the Tibetan government did not give him the horses to ride. So, so even he has no authority to get the horses for himself to go to Danansa. So this clearly implies that Manchu Emperor, the Manchu Ambans in Tibet has no role and no power, nothing in Tibetan affair in 1904. This is one incident. Okay. Second, why British uh, military invasion or military expedition came to Lhasa in 1904? There are three reasons, only mainly two reasons. First, very important, in 1890 and 1893, the British and China, China government, China, they have signed a treaty, two treaties, relating to Tibet. The 1890 treaty was rela regarding the Tibet-British uh, India border issue. 
uh, and the 19, 1893 treaty is the treaty regarding the British Tibet trade relation. So they were, and so these, these two treaties relating to the Tibet regarding British India, British Tibet, uh, British India uh, and Tibet border issue and British India and Tibet trade relation. Treaty was signed between the China and British India, but the treaty was not accepted by the Tibetan government. And, and until 1904, the, these two treaties have, have not been implemented. And these two issues are very critical issues for the British India in 1904. So then they said, okay, we must contact directly to the Tibetans and make Tibetan to accept these two, accept these treaties. That's what's the point. Rwa, tere. That did Tom Chiagin Rwa. Chik dong gege kubchu tamba da kubchu kosum gulola. Inji dang, kaha inji dang, pe karsa kana ni parala, pe dan denjong the santam, denjong or joke, pe dang, inji ni para, the santam, the gensam tidang. Further engineering parallel, Tongje Chejo called a Tonset T. Cola, Gemidang, uh, engineering parallel, Chinji Shabati, Chigdon Kubji Chume, Shipado, Pebekel and Chadi Amari. The Pebe, Peba the Devi Tonsa, Tondati, Tapolo Maji Vacheni, Rwa, Mata Tato, some Tapo Kojol Pisan in the Chin, Jenny Chin, Yavatin, and the Kelling Vacheni, Kelling Chad, and never in the Anni. That Chingi Tonsen Tini Nidi. Per the engineer Paraga Sansam Gedeva, per the engineer Paraga Songre Gedeva T, Lanet to be a la tacker per round the Deva Cheni, Deva Che Gichedu, and the Mada Yongerwa. Mada Mayuna Pepeke Shero Chigo Amari, and Mada Yong the Pepper Pearl Yon Tonsen Dini Kalin Cher Jugurwa, says that to do Sati Gabla. So this clearly shows that again the, the Manchu government has no role, has no uh, power in interfering the Tibetan affair. And that the most important is second one. Uh, this. So now second one is the, sec the second reason of 1904 British invasion to Tibet was to to, uh, to prevent to prevent the Russian influence Russian, uh, Russian influence into Tibet. That was the immediate purpose. So here, in the in the ninth uh, in the ninth point in the ninth chapter of the uh, okay. Did you the tunzu kuba di lo nangro na dan di to di di re chingu kuba di Perna ma yong hoya di kap chik don ye ya kubju ye me ne per na ursu ni ke para de jeva tsuk de yeva yin zang. Per gu na lo la ursu ki shukye male ya di ngong go che ya ke che du ani inji ki yong ne ani inji ki ani pebe ursu de nyam do le jeva meche ya jeva tsam cho che ya di kele che ru chukye ali de yong bari. Jan di tunta kuwa de ma lo na la kare 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 che ru chukye maare salak du. So, there it. The, in the ninth uh, article of the uh, uh, of the 1904 British Tibet uh, Treaty signed in Lhasa, it it the main intention of this point was to prevent any foreign interventions, particularly the Russian influence into Tibet, coming of Russian influence into Tibet. So ninth point clearly it says like this. It says that. Uh, the government of Tibet engaged that without the previous consent of the British government, no portion of Tibetan territory shall be ceded, sold, leased, or, or mortgaged, or otherwise given to the occupation to any foreign power. Now, this is very important. Any foreign power, any foreign power includes China. Now, this must be understood any foreign power, including China. So no foreign power 
including China, should be permitted. And like this, and then second says, no such power shall be permitted to intervene. Okay, yeah. There. And then says, no representative or agent of any foreign power shall be at, admitted to Tibet. And then says, no concession for railway, road, telegram, mining, and other rights shall be given to any foreign power here, including China, you know, uh, or the subject of any foreign, foreign power. In the event of the consent of such concessionals being granted to any foreign power, then similar or equivalent concession shall be granted to British government also. So there, so, so this clearly show that that this foreign power includes China. It means China, the Manchu government, by the year 1904, has no role and no influence in the Tibetan domestic and uh, foreign affair. Then again, 1908. 1908, Dalai Lama went to Beijing to meet the Qing last emperor. So now here says, the meeting was, the meeting of Dalai Lama and last emperor was fixed on eighth month and sixth day of the eighth month. But it was postponed, it, the, meeting, the meeting of these two dignities, two persons, on the fixed date could not be held because of the disagreement on the the manner and the manner and process of meeting the Dalai Lama and the Emperor. The Chinese side they say that the Dalai Lama must do the uh, they say uh, the means they should prostrate with four hands and the Dalai Lama says no. This is not where we will meet. I will, we will meet as the third, fifth Dalai Lama and the first emperor of Manju Emperor. How did they will be? So, so lastly, the meeting was held. Now there's two uh, versions. The Brit English version and foreign version, they said that uh, the uh, emperor was standing on his throne. This is very unusual. Uh, emperor meeting somebody, but standing on his throne. Very unusual. So, uh, compromise was made. Emperor standing on his throne. Dalai Lama uh, uh, says he, he with one leg kneeled. This is one edition. And Jacoba says the uh, Dalai, the Manchu emperor was standing on his throne, and Dalai Lama offered him the uh, statue and feather. That was so. Here the meeting of Dalai Lama and last emperor was not as a king and subject. It was a, the, it was a meeting of two equal personality. So which again implicate that Tibet was not under the Manchu influence in those days. Now this is very interesting. And in 1908 Dalai Lama went to uh, Beijing and so the meeting was not very uh, fruitful, and he when he came back to Tibet, and in the November 18th, in the 11th of November 1900, Dalai Lama came back to Lhasa, and the people of the Tibet, the people of the people of Tibet, offered him the golden seal. And since that day, most of the documents signed by the Dalai Lama bears this seal, and the seals uh, given by the Manchu previous Manchu emperors were rejected and not used since from that date. So that again shows the, the Manju uh, Tibet relation, the nominal Manju uh, relation was again rejected. Okay, then second, at the same time, that is around uh, November 1909, Dalai Lama set up, established the Tibetan foreign uh, 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 foreign Affairs Department separately, Foreign Ministry Department of Foreign Affairs separately, and since that day, all the relations with the foreign foreign countries, including China, was done through the Foreign Department or Foreign Ministry, Chindelego. 
So that again. Okay, then. Okay, and then again, 19, at the beginning of the 1910, Dalai Lama have to flee to India because of the arrival of Chinese troops to Lhasa. And, and Dalai Lama and his cabinet went to India with the intention that, with the hope that they could communicate to the Beijing from India and ask for the withdrawal of Chinese troops which are in stationed in Tibet. But there was no response from the Beijing and Beijing had uh, published this statement in the Indian newspaper. It says that the Dalai Lama, uh, the Dalai Lama had been rejected. The, the Thubden Jatoda, the 13th Dalai Lama, had been rejected from the post and the dignity post of Dalai Lama, and now he is an ordinary man, and we are in the process of electing a new Dalai Lama. Lama. This is, they published it in Indian newspaper, and the similar statement was published in, uh, published and posted in Lhasa by the uh, uh, Amban, and that made the Tibetans so furious and so angry that the Chinese, they realized that within a month or two, they realized that that was the, one of the biggest mistakes they have performed. And now Dalai Lama and Tibetans, they are no more uh, in the contact with the, Dalai, uh, with the Beijing government. So that was another mistake. Okay, now this is interesting. That Dalai Lama's uh, expression, the word statement. Uh, now this is a very important document. Uh, this is a, a copy of the letter written by 13 Dalai Lama to Tsar. And this letter was carried from Tibet in the month of August 1912 by <coughs> Awan Doji and he delivered it to the Tsar. Oh, now this, this letter, uh, and in this letter, Dalai Lama mentioned the use the term per Ranzen Seta. This expression, so called the per Ranzen Seta, was first found in this document. So here, you will get there are three. Uh, uh, the, he mentioned the per in uh, in three things. Some love sharba. That the gentleman more sharba. The Java country just some be chig don't come chig chung ni. Ki Java Java ye me chig la. Ani Russia ke kab dudu ke Russia ke Java la. Chati tam va tig dashu re. The awan doji ke sense of doji ke nam pe do ni tig yig tig dashu. Now here he used the expression declaration of Tibetan independence. But what is important is what is his intention in uh, what is intention of using this expression. What is the, what was the context? In what context he used this expression and what he really intend to say? That is important, I think so. So he says, there's some durva. Now I'm not going to read this. And here he says clearly, oh, I have the English translation. Okay, this is it. Okay, he says, now this is very important. To firmly establish, establish friendly relation between Russia and Tibet, we have decided to draw off a treaty. Now, this is the letter written by 13 Dalai Lama to the Tsar of Russia. And here he clearly says that we are willing to, we, are, we have determined to sign a treaty with the Russia. Now, if and then he says, now after that, okay, okay next, read Here he says, although we greatly wish to declare the, as soon as possible independent of Tibet, 
in consultation with you, means you here refers to the Tsar. But, he says, but he intend to declare the independence of Tibet, but he is not able to do so because the British continues insist, British continue to insist on the acceptance of the Chinese suzerainty over Tibet. Now this is the point. So this is the Chinese suzerainty over Tibet was mentioned in the 1907 Russia Tibet Russia China no Russia British Treaty. There were, and then again he says. Now the, in the same letter he says, "Kya pe rangse ji tira yin be de doa pe kya kang rangse yin be tira de sung doa." And here also he says, "Before oh, okay, thus Chen Shap Awan Dorjib and other invites have been dispatched." with the specific purpose of seeking your advice on the significant and confidential issue. What is that confidential issue? He says, we wish the Russians to discuss the con issues concerning Tibet with the British and direct the invite. Direct the invite. Invite here refers to Awan Dorjib and the Tibetan two or three persons who are accompanying uh, uh, Awan Dorjib. So direct them to Immediately declared the independence of Tibet. Here he says. Now he here he says. Now he here he mentioned the declaration of independence of Tibet in the context of British consistent uh, in insistent of accepting the Chinese suzerainty over uh, Chinese suzerainty over Tibet. So that's okay. Now no time. No, I will just okay. And then again, he says, Tibet is now a self sovereign independent state, and the foreign countries should re are requested to render the assistance according to the British Russia Treaty, 1907 treaties, without causing harm. Okay, now, now in this context, that uh, Tibet and uh, Mongol Tibet uh, Treaty signed in 1913 is relevant. If Dalai Lama, if he authorized, I want Doji if to sign a treaty with Russia, then why not he is why not he is not authorized to sign a treaty with Mongol? So this is I ex I d explained I discussed it detail in my uh, article the uh, legal legal legality of uh, uh, Tibet Mongol treaty 1930 in my uh, uh, last paper. So so here. The treaty, Tibet-Mongol treaty was signed in 1913, but Dalai Lama instructed Awan Dochi if to sign this treaty in 1912, because Dalai Lama and Awan Dochi if their last departure was August 1912. So, so everything was decided before August 12. So now this, now why British are British is unwilling to accept the independence of Tibet. You must understand the British Tibet policy. This is very clear here. Dalai Lama's here, neither the Dalai Lama's rejection of Chinese suzerainty over Tibet and declaration of independence from Tibet suits British interest. So they don't want to do that because that neither of them uh, suits British interest. Because here, the Dalai Lama is consistent. Now here, Dalai, Dalai Lama's declaration of Tibetan independence is stated in the context of refusing the Chinese suzerainty over Tibet. Dalai Lama clearly says like that. No, we are not under the Chinese suzerainty, under the suzerainty of Chinese. This is what the Dalai Lama says. So we are not under the suzerain of China. We are uh, independent. This is what he, Dalai Lama intend to say. OK. Then this, again, and the last one. No, the British, again, the second reason why the British don't want to accept uh, Tibetan independence was second. This is the British interest were the were best served by the treaties by treating Tibet as a so self-governing dominant nominally under China, but 
with the Chinese influence limited and the relation with the other European countries virtually non existent So this is, this is the British uh, Tibet policy. So they under, what? And then again, the, 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 on the other side, the Chinese, the Republic of uh, China at that time, their, uh, nor the Republic of China's policy of considering Tibet as a province of China suited British interests. These are the factors which, uh, uh, factors which, on which the uh, British declined to accept the independence of Tibet. Okay, now I think, so, so these three treaties, 1904 treaties between British and Russia, no, British and Tibet signed in Lhasa, 1906, China and uh, British uh, treaty, and 1907 treaties signed between the Russia and uh, Britain. They, these th three treaties have, they have determined, they have decided the political status of Tibet based on their interest, nothing to do with the facts. So, so now no time, I'm not going to read this, but. Okay, now this is very interesting. As uh, the earlier, one, our earlier speaker says, during that period of the time, the Russia, the, 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 the Mongols and Tibetans, we are more, uh, 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 facing the more or less the same situation. And the situation is very identical. The Russia and Britons, they, are, they wanted to establish, Russia, they wanted to establish Mongol as a buffer state between the Mongols, between the China and Russia. British in wanted to uh, establish Tibet as a buffer state between the British India and China. So same, same uh, pattern of uh, events took place. In 1912, December 3, uh, the treaties between Russia and Mongol was signed. More or less at the same time, the 1904 a treaty between Tibet and British India was signed in Lhasa. Then now, then following that, now this is what the uh, diplomat normally say that this is the failure of British diplomacy. This is what he called the failure of British diplomacy. How British failed in their diplomacy? It will. Then, in 1913, uh, November 5, the Russia and China signed a treaty in which the Russia-Mongol treaty was accepted. And on the other hand, there was no treaty signed between British and China uh, accepting the uh, uh, British-Tibet treaty signed in Lhasa. One British side, one failure. Not the second biggest failure is in 1915, in 1915, Russia, China, and Mongol tripartite treaty was signed in 1950. And so by this treaty, the China recognized the existence and independent status of Mongolia. Okay? On the other hand, in 1940, tripartite uh, convention was held in Simla between China, <coughs> British India, Tibetan, but British failed to make China accept this treaty. So the Tibetan uh, uh, existence or Tibetan uh, political, independent polit uh, political existence was not accepted by the Chinese at all. Okay, now I will conclude. Uh, I think something wrong went. Maybe. Uh, Loshira, nice. Okay. Loshina, okay, no problem. Now I will include, conclude. No problem, Rua. Uh, 
So now I will conclude. Because the uh, 13 Dalai Lama's Declaration of Independence, this statement was made in the context of refusing the Chinese suzerainty over Tibet. Dalai Lama consistently said, no, we don't accept the uh, Ch Chinese suzerainty over Tibet. We are sovereign. We are the Tibetan issue and Tibetan affair is directly handled by us. There's no Chinese role and other role. What he was trying to say is we are sovereign, self-governing body, self-governing government, and the other independent countries are requested to accept the independent status of us. This was he was trying to say. So here, uh, on the conclusion that that is, เจ้าคนที่จะสมบัติเพื่อนอาจารย์เซตัสเนี่ยดีเจ้าสมบัติเมื่อเราอาจารย์ไม่เห็นปฏิทัดเจ้าสมบัติอันนี้จุงเนี
we will meet next time to give the answer to all these questions. So that's <laughs> very good. Questions. Yeah, too many questions means we will meet too many times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So finally, uh, this so what I intend to say is that the phrase used by the 13th Dalai Lama in the letter to Tsar, say the, uh, the Declaration of Tibetan Independence was said in what context? So that I uh, try to explain it. And now there's, I'm, time has already gone, finish. I took 10 minutes extra. I'm sorry for that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, all the speakers. We don't really have much time to take questions, so I'm just going to conclude the session. Perhaps we can take one question. Uh, so it was incredibly instructive panel. It was quite educational, instructive. I, I think one of the things that came up with the presentation is the recovery of history is extremely important, particularly for uh, suppressed nations. And the recovery of history, the intellectual traditions, is, is, is a mode of, you know, there's this, trend within the academia about decolonizing various fields of discipline. So perhaps one of the ways through which we can study Tibetan history, and, and, and I think this panel was instructive in a sense that it has given us methods to revisit many of the incidents in the past and um, to be able to revisit the history and then to be able to put Tibetan and Mongolian history in context of the broader global history. So I think that that's something that came up and I think it was incredibly enriching for me as a student of modern Tibetan history and I'm sure many of us in this um, gathering has equally profited from this panel. So uh, if I can be incredibly generous, I can just take one question. Thank you.